Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 156. In this episode, we chat with Sam Drogi, a wildlife biologist at the U.S. Geological Survey, all about gardening for native and specialist bees. The plant profile is on bronze fennel, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with a tribute to the late, great garden writer Pam Harper as our last word. This episode, I'm joined by Sam Drogi. He is a wildlife biologist at the USGS Bee Lab in Laurel, Maryland. Welcome, Sam. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Great to have you here. And if you are in the D.C. area and you are in a garden club or similar organization, you've probably seen Sam give a talk on bees and been blown away by the images he's shown and so we'll talk about those and some of the photography and, and your work, Sam. But first, we want to talk a little bit about you and your background. And so we ask our guests here at the Garden DC podcast, were they born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb, knowing that you're coming from the wildlife side of things, um, that might not be the case? No, it absolutely is the case. And in fact, When I, uh, so I grew up in the area, I grew up in Hyattsville and my parents have always said that they knew exactly what I was going to be doing when I was seven and I, meaning something with nature. Mm. And when I was that young, I was disconnected from, you know, bird watchers. There weren't, there was no helicoptering in my family. And so we were feral, but I was attracted to the library and books on things and then plants. So I would take cuttings of uh, various neighbors and friends' uh, plants and try to, you know, stick them in water and then pot them. And so I had in my bedroom, probably unlike other kids' bedrooms, was filled with plants that I grew myself. And so I spent a lot of time there. And then my buddy Butch Herlinger in the neighborhood, his Aunt Rita had a subscription to organic gardening and farming. It was both at that time. And we we were both just fascinated by this and completely got sucked into the organic world. And so by, we're talking about the sixties. Okay. So this is a long time ago. And so by the time I was in sixth grade, I had a organic vegetable garden in the back. Uh, My parents didn't quite know what to do with that, particularly when I asked (laughs) to go to college park to get manure from the, you know, the uh, back then they actually had a a farm operation there. Mm -hmm. So, that went there and then, but I was also at the same time, as you mentioned, very attracted to wildlife, particularly birds. Um, I didn't have any models. It's a long story, but eventually I got connected to the Maryland Ornithological Society, so the local bird watching clubs. And that was it. You know, like I was in, I spent almost all my time in the woods and I would skip school not to drink under the bleachers like everyone else probably, but maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But anyway, I would go skip school and go bird watching. And um, so that's been my gear, I guess, all my life. And so I've always had gardens. Um, I've done different things in those gardens, in those garden spaces, not a fan of lawn and a fan of um, spending as much time as possible in nature. In fact, I, I essentially need that. Like I can't be in an environment that's too urban or suburban or concrete walls or government gray um, furniture, I have to at least get out and go for a walk and poke around, which is useful when you're learning natural history. It's all about experience. Mm -hmm. And so your childhood in Hyattsville, we should probably let listeners know, especially those outside the D.C. area, the Mid-Atlantic, that that's a suburb of Washington, D.C., but it's a very 
treed and um, full of wonderful plant suburb. It has a long time horticultural society. I was going to say historic society, which it probably does too. Um, And very active. And because a lot of the USDA employees um, who are naturally a lot of plant lovers either move there or nearby in Tacoma Park originally. Yeah. Well, let me just qualify that. My neighborhood was locally, it was the Lewisdale neighborhood, and it was a typical scraped landfilled chunk of land. Mm -hmm. We lived in a duplex. It was really like a classic kind of horrible suburban neighborhood. If you're a nature person, the advantage was we fronted on the Anacostia River. So I spent all my time in the floodplains and along the creek and um, it wasn't that wide back in that area. And so that was the sort of my salvation. Mm-hmm. And it had no trees <laughs> oh, <laughs> except no. for the, you know, as a typical five, here's your tree package for your new suburban dream duplex <laughs> of in the inexpensive blue collar neighborhoods that we built for you that had a million problems with drainage and all kinds of other things. So, you know, there was a silver maple and an ash and a Lombardy poplar and Mm -hmm. maybe one other thing, most of which just up and died because it was subsoil. But anyway, I was able to bring in compost and do a bunch of that kind of regenerative um, gardening, raised bed things. And then ultimately my dad got inspired and took it over after I left. But so just wanted to qualify that. I was not in some, you know, the wonderful parts of Tacoma Park and Hyattsville. (laughs) I visited. I love those areas. Yeah. And things have developed over the last 50 or plus years as well. So things have actually filled in and and what are now the older suburbs are, you know, definitely much more green. Well, let's talk about your garden today and uh, what you're growing in your garden. Yeah, so I really have two gardens. I have a garden at uh, my house. So I have an acre. Uh, it was all lawn. Now I have some minuscule amount of, of lawn uh, that I tend only with a string trimmer. And I'm very fond of string trimmers. And then I'll use a brush blade to take back down the rest of the gardens, which are so a complex Um, native plant gardens, um, edging to wild at the edges, and then more, I don't even really want to say formal, but uh, beds more weeded out beds um, in the, uh, close to the house and, you know, a little vegetable spot here and there. And then at the lab, we have a 30 acre compound that used to be used for raising whooping cranes and sandhill cranes. Every imaginable invasive species was in there. And we need to grow and have a uh, complex of hoop houses, two, as a matter of fact, soon three, to raise native plants that are very difficult to find in the wild so that we can do bee plant interactions and study them there. So we also are confronted by what many gardeners have, which is I have some kind of rough, non ready to go um, planting area in weeds and invasive species in our case. And I have to flip that and make it into something that for us is mostly research, but still has to have the same kind of parameters. You know, very few weeds, primarily the species we're interested in, Mm -hmm. needs to present well, we need to move around in it. So um, in both those cases, I'm maintaining a most, almost entirely native plant set of communities. And I'm trying to mirror what is found in a very broad sense, um, in natural areas in the region. And then we study the complexity, both at home, my home and my lab life uh, converge and there's not a lot of boundaries between the two. I'll just mention as an aside that we even do things like create our own bogs and create our own raised beds with sandy soils because um, the, particularly at the lab, the soil is a silt clay, which is great for a lot of things. But um, certain, like, very dry-loving plants don't like to be there. And certainly it's not a bog place either. So we're edging towards a, a major garden kind of complex there, but for bees. Hmm. And so how are you eliminating those invasives and, and switching those over for the home gardeners? I'm sure they would like some tips. Oh, yeah. We have a whole methodology. So... 
I'm sure parts of this have been covered. Let's say I have lawn, which is the easiest thing to flip, but we'll do about the same thing if I have a brush hogged um, annually kind of complex of invasive shrubs and vines and who knows what else. Poison ivy is one of our major growing plants in the area. Native, actually a pollinator plant, but usually not something we want to see in the gardens. So let's back up. We're not using any chemical control here. And we're not using any mechanical control in the terms of like, I'm not flaming them out or anything. What we do is chips. So we take arborist chips, um, which people know probably about chip drop, but we also have some relationships with some of the local um, arborist companies to drop chips off. And so the pattern is pretty much the same. Any area, um, let's say it's lawn, eight to 12 inches of chips get dropped and spread over the section that we want to flip. We don't put down cardboard. We don't cut the grass. We don't rototill the area. We do absolutely no preparation. So it's an easy lift in terms of like if we're talking about a homeowner kind of thing, you're basically spreading mulch and that's it. So at that time, and it can be as fresh as, as chipped that day. So there's no, you know, there's this notion that chips are going to suck out or sawdust or anything else are going to suck out all the nitrogen in the soil. That's really, it's been shown Oregon state has some really good stuff on this. Um, that's not the case with arborist chips. They're coarse. They allow the soil to breathe, but they suppress the growth. They are supplying a magical amount of carbon for all the fungal communities, bacterial communities and invertebrates that are in the soil. So this soil sometimes is just terrible. We have done this on gravel parking lots. We've done this on subsoil from the septic tank. Again, it was oriented towards basically industrial production of these animals and not towards like, oh, beautiful environment or fluffy organic soils full of compost. That's all we do. We throw down the chips deep and then we will plant plugs or plants um, through the chip mulch basic rule being okay you need to make a little crater in that depth and then the plug or the plant needs at minimum to be touching the mineral soil below and that's it um, in some cases we're nowhere near water so they're not getting watered at all and mm. do well and in other cases you know we'll if they're near the lab <clears throat> we we won't hesitate to give them a little water to establish but usually there's no watering involved here and that's it. So, um, so let's talk about a little bit, maybe about what gets through. That's not your plant. So, mm -hmm. what gets through? If you're in a lawn environment, Bermuda grass can penetrate back up through. Yes, but it struggles, and it's in chips. Nothing else is coming up. It's relatively easy to pull out, and in you know, with some, you can't be like, oh, this is my solution to everything. I've smothered it and I've chemical it chemicalize it, you have to put in some effort to catch the Bermuda grass before it re it'll just retake over if you don't. And then some of the ground ivy will move in from the sides. So you just have some of this um, low level maintenance to take care of. Uh, and really the Bermuda grass goes away if you pull it a few times. And it's a nice environment to work in. And because the soil is becoming loose, it's easy to pull that stuff out. And then they're repressed again, right? They're underneath all this chip. So it's generally pretty easy. But when you move into more and more environments where you have established perennial woody plants, uh, positive uh, ones um, might be uh, things you might want to retain, like goldenrod and asters. Depends on how you feel about, you know, pretty thuggish um, native plants. And other times it's um, an invasive a calorie pear that you just mowed it's going to come right through that and um, things like poison ivy um, and a couple of the vines um, are super unhappy about being buried to that depth but they will push back up through i have to say um, virginia creeper is the champion at coming back up <laughs> but you can you keep at pulling them or chopping mm -hmm. them out you know we do different things and you can take care of them if you want to in those environments. The better thing is to rototill the whole thing. If you have access to that or you want to go to that trouble, 
But literally in lots of our cases, we just bury everything mm -hmm. and then deal with what comes up. And then in subsequent years, your perennials, which is this is a perennial bed, or you have to replant the annuals, obviously, um, they come right through that mulch. And you have, ultimately, you have, particularly like, say, the um, year three, you will have a good seed bed for everything. Even your native plants, if, particularly if they're open seeded varieties, are going to start dropping seed and they'll start sprouting. Um, you can either say, oh, good, I've got some free plants to give away, or you can spread in late winter a layer of two to three inches of chip over everything and the plants just come right back up. So that's in a nut, the, um, our strategies for flipping areas. Very helpful. Cause I know a lot of people are encountering, encountering that same type of situation, mm -hmm. you know, they have a house and the backyard has been let go or they purchase a property and it's just all pretty much invasives that you see. Yep. Um, so that's great remediation advice. Yep. So let's turn now to talk about your work, um, especially with native bees in the mid-Atlantic mm -hmm. area. So many of our listeners are familiar with honeybees and the honeybee plight that we've heard of and planting for pollinators. But let's talk specifically about what gardeners can do to support and attract our native bees. Got it. Yeah. So first, a tiny context. When we're talking bees, everybody, literally everybody knows what a honeybee is. It's mm -hmm. culturally, it's the same as a cow or a horse. And they're also basically a commodity and also not native species. And they, as basically a non-native thing, are really not involved ecologically with pollinating our native plants. So they're not a needed ecological component. They're also extremely different in their life history. So most people do have facts in a, their Rolodex about bees, which are honeybee facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, honey, waxy comb, multi-year queen, swarms, barb stings, allergic reactions, etc. None of that occurs in the native species. So it's easiest to say now you have to probably forget most of your bee facts because the wild bees are extremely different and very varied. Okay. So they've been here 150 million years. The plants, the wild plants, the wildflowers, native plants that you see, all that diversity of when they flower, color, size, shape, um, tree, shrub, um, location, habitat, is a collaborative venture with these local bees. So if we looked at, at the mid-Atlantic, Maryland and the surrounding states, let's say, there's over 500 species of wild bees involved. And most people can't pull up things, but can with a little help. So like bumblebees, for most people, it's the bumblebee, 14 species just in Maryland though. Um, and then mason bees, which maybe gardeners are now aware of and bring in tubes and things like that. There's 25 different species of those and on down this list to a, if you go out in your garden right now and you look at almost any plant, so some of the non-native plants do attract bees and we can talk about that, but um, you will see very small bees. Well, you might not even recognize them as bees. They're size of the grain of rice or smaller and they're doing much of the pollination. Mm. They are incredibly abundant. Most of them, and also most of the native bees in general, are solitary moms, right? So they are making, each female is making it her own nest, and they don't defend that nest. Many of them, the, their sting can't penetrate even our skin, and they don't, certainly don't defend flowers, neither do honeybees. So all of this leads to, and they're not producing honey and all the wonderful things that honeybees do leads to a, um, a culture of, uh, we don't need to know anything about these things. They're just a given. I can't even see them. They're not like butterflies where they're big and beautiful, which I think they are, but at a very small level. Um, and so we don't, we just, there's no reason for us to know much. And even from an agricultural point of view, pollination of crops used to essentially just be a gimme, right? Things happen. You had honeybees in your orchard, or maybe you didn't, and you still got 
as much pollination as you needed. We had a crisis with honeybees in terms of a set of introduced pathogens caused some of these managed populations to crash. We, we know how to deal with that now, okay, as an industry. Um, but people, because of their limited understanding of what bees are and whether they're, what these native bees are doing, those are all honeybee issues. So the problems that made the newspaper were issues surrounding honeybees, which had almost no translation to the wild bees. So the wild bees mm -hmm. were still doing their merry way, but it got people thinking like, oh, what if all the honeybees disappear? All our crops are doomed. Actually, that's also not the case. It turns out now that people are looking a little bit more that a lot of our native species are like, wow, apples, we're into that, you know, because we have native crabs and apples are a generalist pollination strategy. And which means that we call them party plants. So uh, cherry, all the, the, um, the rosaceish things, yeah. blackberry, uh, cherry, uh, on down this long list, Juneberry, they basically bloom for a short period of time, tons of pollen and nectar, easy access flowers, just like a child would draw and no, not much in the way of additional secondary compounds or poisons to keep out. They're not friends because the idea is attract as many things as possible. So that worked for native bees and for non-natives. And so much of our fruit and vegetable crops are fine with or without honeybees. So, wow, if we move to, okay, well, why all these species of honeybees, I mean, of native bees, what we find is that many of our native bee species are not generalists, like a honeybee is a generalist. It has to use a lot of species across an entire um, growing season. And in the native bee world, many of these native bees are out for only like a seven week window and they're not very common because about 40% of the um, native pollen carrying bees are um, highly specialized. In the, so I use things like prickly pear, um, willow, something as surprising as pickerel weed. It can be wetland, it can be upland, it can be trees, it can be not trees. Chestnut had a specialist bee, for example. So, mm -hmm. so specialized that if you, for example, remove chestnut, which by the way happened because of the diseases of chestnut, then they disappear. But chestnut, interesting example. The chinkapin, which is the same genus and basically is just a stumpy little chestnut, um, remained, had problems, but you can still find them and that retained the um, specialist bee. And now we find that when we grow back chestnut, American chestnut, not Chinese chestnut, um, or one of the others, we, uh, there's that bee, it's still there. It, bees are really good at dispersing. And that's a big advantage. If we wanna come back to gardening and gardeners, you can make a big difference, right? Depends on what you plant as to what you're helping because of all the specialization going on out there. But it's a little confusing because, you know, let's take uh, Budlia, right? Great, you know, butterfly bush, great plant, has butterflies all over it. And you can look on there and go like, darn it, there are lots of bees on there. This must be a good pollinator plant. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of that kind of uh, approach to um, any kind of plant that has a bee on it is considered to be good. Well, we're now kind of at phase two here in trying to help bees. So um, this, the analog, because it's difficult because people don't have an, an inherent understanding of our wild bees, is the analog is a good one with birds. So I have a, a lot of land. Um, it's in the woods. I come in and I do what everyone does. I scrape everything off. Um, I put in lawn, I build a house, and then I put in a bird feeder, right? I get birds. I get so many birds at that bird feeder that the density of birds in my yard is higher than in the surrounding woods. But it's crows and sparrows and pigeons and starlings, not birds that need our help. The birds that need our help are gone because you remove that woods, scarlet tanagers, uh, Kentucky warblers, huge list of things that would never be in a lawn oriented um, you know, primarily non-native lawn. And so the same thing would be true of our non-native, but flowering 
and attractive to pollinator plants. There are pollinators all over there, but those are the crow and sparrow bees of the bee world, of the native bee world. And many of them are just honeybees. And because there are a set of bees that are tolerant of urban conditions, and because they're also out all year long, just like the honeybee, they're like, you know what? We have to use lots of different kinds of plants. We can't be picky. And an invasive plant is just another one of a long supply chain of different pollen and nectar sources for them. Most of the time, many, much of the time, it's really a nectar source. It's like you are building a system on 7-Elevens rather than, I don't know, Four Seasons or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe more like Whole Foods, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a, a Whole Foods store or something. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of a nutshell. There's so much complexity. So each bee species, each one of these wild bee species has its own story like the honeybee, but they're so different and they're so different from each other, but it all comes back. If you want to save wild bees, you plant native plants of a variety of kinds. If you want, I can go through the simple, a simple planning thing, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, oh my God, there's, that's too many variables. It's so technical, which it is right now, because who even knows the names of these wild bees? I do, but I like, you know, that's my world. <laughs> exactly. But the average person is like, yes, I want to help bees, but, uh, you know, I don't have time to get into the weeds. And then I don't know how uh, to make a decision. You know, there's so many plants involved in things like that. So here's the a general set of rules. One, plant native plants, right? And straight natives, I'll say too. So you probably know some of the controversies there. But basically, if it's a plant, native or not, that has gone into production by a nursery company or plant grower, um, you don't ever get more pollen and nectar. You either have about the same or less. Now, Cuba, great trials that look into these kinds of things because a plant grower doesn't ask the plant to produce more pollen and nectar and help bees out. It wants shorter stature, longer season, bigger blooms, different colors, um, more sepals, whatever it might be. All of that is um, not necessarily going to attract any more bees or help them because the bees ultimately need pollen and nectar. And from the plant point of view, where do they get that plant money to do all this extra stuff, pollen and nectar? Because that costs plants tons in terms of energy. So yes, you can find a bunch of cultivars or named varieties that do attract a lot of native bees. But over time, um, I'm talking about cultural time of more and more breeding, crossbreeding, and you know you can if it's a hybrid, just forget it. But over time, we will end up with pansies and begonias for the native plants too, you know, a couple hundred years from now, and they have nothing. So straight natives, native plants, and you're also supporting. So we're talking about support rather than attraction. So budley attracts bees, but it's like bird feeders attract birds. We're talking about native plants supporting this huge community of bees. So that's one, which ones? So the idea is bloom throughout the year. So relatively, okay, it's, and also it's bloom, right? So conifers and things like that are not attractive. If it has a colored blossom and we're talking white, yellow, or blue, or shades in between, that's basically a bee pollinated plant or a pollinator, insect pollinated plant. Cause the plant, why would the plant do that? Why would it produce a flower for any other reason? not to please us, but to be the, the plant app for connecting bee to plant. It's color unusual, right? So let's erase all of our lovely colors that we like to have in there. It's novel to have blue in the environment, to have yellow in the environment, to have white in the environment. So the plant uses that and the bees see it, which is unusual for many animals. Most, like, most of the mammals other than us, they see basically a more black and white world than color world. So there's, there's your plant apps, flowers. So if it has a flower and it's a native plant, you're doing good. Hmm. If it blooms throughout the year, now you've provided a whole series of floral communities and that's going to be good because some bees are out 
early in the spring, some mid spring, some late spring, some early summer, some midsummer, and so forth to the fall, tracking different sets of plants, sometimes one species of plant. Um, if you want gory details, we do have a website, which I can give you the link to. You can look up my name and Jared Fowler, um, and it lists plants that have specialist bees. These are not rare plants mm -hmm. because you can't build a specialist bee plant system on, when you have rarity involved because at some point the, the whole plan is going to fail because you've run, you know, things have disappeared too much. So there are things like sunflowers, composites, asters, goldenrods that can be involved in the garden. You can go in the spring and all the vernal spring flowers, many of them have um, a specialist bee that attends them. Spring beauty, classic, great for, you know, interspersing in the lawn underneath some of your trees in your yards, almost never done, but there's a bee only goes to spring beauties. And we can look at uvularia and, uh, you know, gera wild geraniums on, on down this list. Very, very extensive. That's phase two. But again, native plants, straight natives, bloom throughout the year, varieties of colors. Why are there different flower colors? That, those plants are attracting different sets of bees just by color alone. We've seen that many times. So different colors, different, more expansive number of bees. Shapes, think of morning glories. Think of the fact that a morning glory blooms in the morning. Mm -hmm. What's that about? There's a set of bees, long tongues come out pre-dawn, and they're in the native morning glories. So like um, Ipomea pandorata, great plant, you know, very underplanted, considered weedy by some, but it's, it looks like a big crimson centered morning glory. Whole set of bees only go to that. Um, and evening primrose, opposite thing. There's a set of bees only come to evening primroses in the evening when no other bees are out. That's the plant strategy. I'm going to eliminate competition for my pollen and nectar by having my friends who party in the morning are partying in the evening and then I'm shutting down. So we go on and on. So things that have long tubes, think of penstemons at this time. Well, they're pretty much done now, but uh, penstemons have a series of bees that only go into penstemons. Look at a penstemon flower. It's crazy where the stamens are and why does it have such a long tube, you know? Why not just be a plain old, you know, blackberry flower? Well, there's reasons and it all has to do with all this complexity. So have a variety of shapes like, oh, I, you know, I don't have a lot of tubular flowers. Um, and then in the wild, we have problems with, and semi-wild or people's like, oh, you know, I have a, a, a pasture here or an old chunk of land on my uh, property. I don't know what to do with it, but you know, I'll cut it several times a year. I'm not going to make it a lawn, but I'm just going to keep it under control. Well, you cut anything during the year, during the growing season, you've eliminated almost all the fall flowers. So a lot of bees that are very, very uncommon are on that set of late season blooming fall composites. And there are some composites that they can make it, make it through. So think of your tall golden rod. It's along all the roadsides and the um, symphotricum frost asters. There's a mm. couple species. They're like, boom, we're, we know what to do here. So that's good. But there are many other species, a lot of the perennial sunflowers, many Bidens, etc. cetera. So um, <clears throat> cut once a year in the winter, if you have property and you need to figure out what to do with a big chunk of land is a good thing. Don't throw trees automatically onto a property because you're like, oh, well, we need more trees. Maybe, um, but we're certainly more treed than we were at two centuries ago where the place was mm. denuded. And we look at what species are of conservation concern in the broadest sense, like all different animals, all different plants, it's transitional habitats. So it's these kinds of open landscapes that have the rare plants because there's nothing generating them that much. So we have to be conscious that more and more we're going to have to be caretakers of the earth and do that purposefully and not just that sort of, well, they'll, you know, laissez-faire, like someone's property will be 
in good shape for these plants. So, and then the last thing is don't think that you have too small a piece of property. Um, mm. You have a veranda on your second story uh, cooperative unit or whatever, plant some things in pots. It takes basically just five flowers to produce enough pollen on average pollen and nectar for a bee to create a nest to create one additional baby bee. So you can't cop out on this. Like I'm not important. So many of these areas have these rare bees in them that are clearly suburban and or yards in rural areas that have been planted native plants. But if, if you don't plant them or you have lawn, there's no contribution. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask specifically about our urban garden. So that does answer partly that of, you know, we can have patio native gardens or balcony or rooftop. And so if you only had a few containers uh, available to you, what would you recommend uh, for native plants that you might grow in them for Uh the the wild bees? Yeah, well, you know, it turns out we did a, so we, uh, a couple years ago, someone wanted to do this and we grow a lot of plants. So they said, well, you know, what plants should we put in there? Um, And because we want to, we have this event and we want to show container gardening for native plants that are good for pollinators. And I was like, you know, I don't do that. Like I don't, we have land. So we just plant them in there. And I'm like, what, what does grow well in containers? And basically almost all of them, uh, maybe actually all of them grow well in a container. So we just took tons of five gallon buckets, filled them with different kinds of often pretty crappy soil through divisions in there. And they all, you know, as long as you water them, you know, watering is obviously one of the big problems in a container operation. They did fine. Um, So I'm going to leave the ultimate answer is to best um, up to the gardener who has their predilections for like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a black eyed Susan person, or I want small, or I want, I want something, you know, big. So I'm going to plant in some perennial sunflowers or, Mm -hmm. you know, um, some things are, I guess I would caution that you're going to have to stake things. If plants are tall naturally, and you've provided lots of really good soil and you're in a semi-shaded environment, like you might on a deck or a um, veranda, but you know, you can stick a state in there too, but Mm -hmm. that, if you're if you're a minimalist on your things, then look for the more like penstemons are a great plant for mm-hmm. that. And you can after they're done, I like the seed heads, but you can lop the seed heads off and you have a nice green plant there through the winter even. So there's many, many things. And I'm, I just urge people to experiment. I also urge people to try things that aren't necessarily in the top tier of we always use black eyed Susans because that's all we know of these native plants. So regionally, well, anywhere really, um, you'll be able to find native plant societies, native plant growers, nurseries, etc., with a much wider palette of available native plants to plant. And I, you know, people are busy. So yes, you can go to the big box store and pick up a lot of things, but most of those are um, named varieties and they're basically just clones. So no, no genetic variation whatsoever, unlikely to help repopulate the area, maybe, or maybe not be good for your bees. So the more um, you can purchase your plants and work with the, the local growers who are almost all going to be open seeded, um, the better. And you certainly can go down the route like we have too, which is growing your own seeds and uh, growing your own plants from things you collect in the wild and all that. But that's, that is effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the container plant ideas, I've been experimenting with mountain mint and blue lobelia, both straight species Mm -hmm. in containers, large containers, of course, not like eight inch or smaller. And I have to report that they're doing wonderfully um, in containers and coming back every year and reseeding themselves, which is great to see. I'll, I'll mention mountain mints as one of our favorite plants. It tends to be um, doesn't really harbor specialist bees, but everything comes there for a drink. And it's so abundant with pollinators. And depending on their your species, they're all roughly about three feet tall, form a dense cluster, flat topped, and all, you can see all the action. So we call it BTV. <laughs> you just go out there and, and 
any time for that really long period of time that they're blooming, there's stuff going on, little dramas. I like that BTV. And then previously you had talked about the rosacea species being, Mm -hmm. um, we would call it a promiscuous plant, but you had a term for that. Um, Yeah, party plant. The party plants. Yes. (laughs) I love that. So we can look at the composites, which are sort of the opposite, many of the composites, but maybe most. Um, So with the composites, if you do analysis of the bees that come to them, many are highly specialized. Like we only do composites. So if you dive into the pollen and nectar of composites, you find a couple things. Both of them are laced with chemical secondary compounds that are repellents in outright poisons. So there's classic experiments where a set of, you have a set of native bees, they have nests, and the researchers will swap the pollen loads around between the species and within the species. So the control is I take a pollen load from one bee of species A, and I give it to another bee also of species A. Those do fine. I swap between species A and species B, everybody dies. The babies die, that is. And because those pollens and the choices that the females make on those species are really specific. And so that's that's why this just plant clover or here's your, you know, big box stores, wildflower seed mix for pollinators isn't going to work uh, because there's all this complexity. Um, additionally, it's not bad. You know, they're pretty flowers. And when people go and get a pollinator mix packet or shaker from a big box store, you know, it's all geared towards annuals and I have to see flowers right away. And so, and I don't really know what I'm looking for in terms of pollinators. If there's a bee on it, we're going to call that good. But it's really, you know, again, it's like a bird feeder thing situation. Yes, you've attracted some pollinators. No, you're not really saving the world here. You're just, you know, shifting the floral um, uh, flowers on the sinking deck of the earth um, Mm. a little bit. So savings, doing significant conservation is about these native, usually perennials and shrubs because of the specialized nature. I have lots of examples of people who plant uh, some of these plants that have specialized bees, boom, they show up, including really, really rare ones that we've been concerned about um, and, um, you know, there they are in someone's garden. You can go down to the National Mall, for example, in Washington, D.C., and there's a couple places. The National Botanic Garden has a wonderful native plant or largely native. Yeah, I guess it's all native plant. Side mm-hmm. garden now filled with all kinds of really interesting native bees that had to cross this gigantic cron- concrete um, area, although possibly hopscotching about on other native plants that were planted in the mini gardens of Capitol Hill, but they found their way there. And that's the thing. You plant it, they will come is something that will happen. I mean, you know, there's limits, but in general, um, you can't also uh, beg off uh, I, that I need to do something for bees because I'm too far into DC or into a middle of a city. Nope. You, you plant the uh, right components of native plants and You're doing a big positive there. You're regaining and becoming and integrating back into the native environment that's largely disappeared. But in your yard, you've added some of that back that was formerly there, but now is yard plus house and street and things like that. Mm -hmm. So important. And so mostly we've talked about native perennials, but there are some shrubs that are Mm -hmm. flower abundant. And so one in particular, the pink street, Azalea yep. is one I love, the New Jersey tea, and I think a couple of the shrubby dogwoods, not the tree dogwoods. Mm-hmm. The Swida group. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and actually you've mentioned, so the Pinkster um, Azalea and a couple, and the other native Azaleas really too, um, have a bee, Andrina Cornelli to be specific, uh, that is basically an Azalea bee. It only goes to native Azaleas and you can find them in plantings and you can find them in the woods. But they're generally, when we're out doing surveys of bees, we don't run across that bee. We have to actually look on 
a pinkster or a native azalea. If they're not planted or the deer have eaten them all out of the woods, they're not there. You know, they're gone. So here is a wonderful place, just with the azalea example of um, supporting that one particular bee species. And I just keep emphasizing that while we're talking bees, there's a huge list of very, to most people, even more obscure insects and other creatures that also spend 150 million years or more growing up with these plants and evolving. And they will move in too, but who's looking at all the cool leaf hoppers and, you know, uh, mining insects, leaf miners and da, 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 da. But you support that too. You just don't necessarily realize that or even have that as your objective. So again, we're bringing, as Doug likes to say, bringing back nature. You don't have to know the details though. Planting native plants, straight species, all sorts of good things happen. And, um, you know, a yard that has a few potted plants that are largely from big box stores that are um, very much derived stock doesn't do much. And we can do a, an awful lot, but it can be just one clump of black eyed Susans. Or, like you said, think uh, trees and shrubs are. Um, not often mentioned as much for pollinator plants, but, you know, they have a greater three-dimensionality. One, for example, of the, the, uh, the Swita group of cornice, so those shrubby dogwoods. Um, if you look, the, you know, they have flowers all over the place. So for that area where the shrub is planted, they're supporting, in some ways, many more bees than if you had planted that with some low-growing perennial, um, simply by the fact that they have height and width and length going on for them. And yeah, I, I plant those in my yard and I get the, they also have a, uh, actually they have three or four different species that only go to them. I get them in my yard too, as uh, along with many other very uncommon and rare bees end up in my landscape because I really got a load of, you know, it's all, it's an acre of uh, all sorts of, you know, native plants. And I also, catch and look at them. So um, I know more than most people would. But if you just pack a yard full of native plants, you're, even though you have no clue what's in there, although you could post pictures to iNaturalist to begin documenting that. That's a really great way to do that. Um, but you're, you're doing a really, really good thing for the environment. I'll make a, a very generalized statement here that um, really has always been part of me, but I really explicitly now understand it and can articulate it. So <clears throat> if you go to, as many people do, they go for walks in the woods and national parks and, you know, natural areas in nature. We don't call that sometimes forest bathing, but there's just generally acknowledgement that that's a good thing. A, you know, go, if you feel like crappy, go into nature you feel better at all these different levels. And there's a natural resonance with that kind of landscape. So imagine in your mind that you're driving on a, a narrow uh, road through, you know, mountain woodlands and on either side, you have the windows down, you're hearing all kinds of birds and you're feeling that oxygen and all that. And your eyes are feasting on all this diversity and complexity and the different kinds of types, which you inherently know, but don't know anything about the names. Now take that same road and travel through your neighborhood or in a strip mall, same size road has options, was like that. And then ask the question, how do I feel? We tend to not think about this. We think uh, I can be very technical. I can say, these plants support these bees. You should therefore plant these plants. But what I'm also saying is you can heal yourself at the largest way, support yourself, support your neighbors, support your health by moving your yard into a landscape that not only supports bees and all these other animals, but is really going to support you when you come back from your forest bathing thing and it's just lawn and five columnar shrubs, you know, think it through. Is that, does that feel the same? You can, like me, I can look out the windows, which I, I love to do. And I think about my window space. I look out and I'm doing right now and I see green and gardens and flowers 
And that feeds me, right? So I just feel like we have, as a society, bought into some sort of, gosh, it really feels toxic now Mm -hmm. that I see this, of that our spaces are required to be so sterile and so non-connected to nature. Lawns are never created by nature and so forth. And I, I soapbox on that all the time now because it's just been, it was inherent to me. Like I didn't question any of this. And then I realized like, oh my God, um, I'm really being supported just by my garden in terms of me. Mm-hmm. And I feel good. And I am a better person simply because I'm now, I don't have to go forest bathing, although I, I do like going out in the field. Um, but I can be at home and I'm supported just as much. Why don't we push that angle a lot more too? So you're doing it for bees, but you're doing it for yourself and your kids and your family and your neighborhood. Great point, Sam. And with our last couple of minutes together, I was going to put you on the spot and ask the question that you probably are dreading and which is, what is your favorite wild bee? Do you have one or a couple? Um, of course, I'm going to say I love them all, but I do have some favorites, and it comes from um, some of the problems that as a, a technical bee person in a way. So one of the difficulties with, you know, 500 species in the area is like, well, what are they? What's How do I tell what they are? It's like bird watchers and fall warblers and things like mm. that. It's like, that's a bird. I can't tell you what it is. It's tricky. So... I'm into the tricky aspects of identification. We do technical guides and so forth. And my favorite group is a group, and we haven't talked about this, of bees that are parasitic on other bees. So people will call them cuckoo bees, um, another bird analog here. But these are bees that don't collect pollen and nectar themselves. They simply invade another species' nest and lay an egg in there. And then their baby kills the other baby and eats all the food. A horrible story, um, but, um, you know, value judgment. And so 20% of all the bees species are fall into that category. And many are uncommon. They obviously have to be less common than their host. And there's a group called Nomada. I don't know what the, there's no real common name for them, but they're very common. You'll see them in the spring in particular, but they're out all year. And they are using a wide range of other bees as hosts. And they're just beautiful. They're actually bright reds, yellows, and um, black combinations. Usually those are the colors in all kinds of stripes and other things. Again, you have to appreciate them mostly if you look down close or you have, like us, mostly bees on pins to look at. And you can look at our photos to see many of these. And um, so I find them endlessly fascinating, both because they're beautiful and I like looking at them, but also because... There's a bunch of undescribed species. Uh, They're doing weird things. Um, We can't figure out their molecular signatures sometimes. So it's a puzzle, puzzly palace plus beauty for me. Hmm. And now that you're mentioning beauty in some of those photos and that we had talked about in the beginning that, Mm -hmm. you know, the amazing images that you share, we should let listeners know because obviously on a podcast, they can't see those photos, how they can access them and then how they can contact you for more information. You bet. So we're actually all over social media. So we have a Facebook group and um, we also are on Flickr, Twitter, Reddit, um, although that's my private one because the government doesn't like us being on Reddit. Uh, Instagram is a big one and Tumblr even. And what we're doing is we're showcasing our pictures and telling stories about them and, among other things. So the picture uh, and all of those are tied to our, I don't know what they call these things, our handle, I guess. So the at sign and then these eight letters, USGS, so U.S. Geological Survey, B-I-M-L, so uh, BIML, and that stands for Bee Inventory and Monitoring Lab, actually our older name. And you can also just look up my last name and a lot of these things because it's a relatively unusual name and bees or USGS and you'll run into these things. 
All the Flickr stuff is where we keep our highest res pictures, and they're all absolutely public domain. Don't even bother asking us about whether you can use them or not, because we're always going to say yes, and we don't. We have you know limited time, so we just take them. Um, we weirdly, because they are so readily available, everyone scrapes them, and so we see these pictures in the weirdest places. Um, so all over the world. I'll t one I saw recently was a, a Walmart project product that had one of our rare, you know, triepialis parasitic bees, very beautiful one as a cover for a cell phone cover and <laughs> uh, yoga pants. I've seen yoga pants with these pictures on them. It's crazy. Anyway, people can do whatever they want. You can resell them. You can modify them, blow them up. They're designed to be super high res. And I've seen them 10 feet tall and they look good. So, wow. And we will include those links in our show notes. And uh, for people wanting to contact Sam directly, uh, we'll have that website and everything in there as well. Yeah, just my email is the best way to, you know, social media allows you to get contacted. But a lot of times I'm not, I'm not on social media. We're just putting things on it. So best is to email me. Great. And any final thoughts for home gardeners in the Mid-Atlantic or even those of our listeners who are worldwide on supporting wild bee populations? I guess I'll just basically reiterate some of the main points there, which is that by shifting your landscape from lawn, from plants that are, you know, highly derived, the the typical foundation plants and things to a largely native plant, or at least even partially native plant environment, you are doing the local environment and the world a huge favor. And it's within your ability to make these changes and to make a local difference. You're not going to bring back wolves or bison into your area. Native bees, you can. And um, I, I guess my last point is, a little bit snarky, which is that when I'm riding around or I'm visiting someone and I see that they have a property that's more than 50% lawn, you know, I'm like, this person doesn't care about the earth. So th there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Sam. You bet. I'm really happy to be here. Bronze Fennel Plant Profile Bronze Fennel, Funiculum vulgar, is an ornamental perennial herb whose ferny, soft foliage, and bright yellow flowers make it a favorite background plant for many gardeners. Its wispy, tall stems look great in combination with other plants, such as rose bushes. The cultivar Purpureum is especially attractive, with a darker, smoky plum coloring to its foliage. Plant it in full sun and it will grow up to six feet high. It does not need staking or fertilizing. It is hardy to USDA zones five to nine and is native to the Mediterranean and Southwest Asia. It's not the kind of fennel that produces a large edible bulb at its base. Instead, it looks and grows more similarly to dill or anise. Bronze fennel is also a great addition to the pollinator garden. The flowers attract many kinds of bees and hoverflies. It's also a host plant that supports the black swallowtail butterflies' caterpillars. You can collect the fresh leaves to use in fish dishes, and the dried seeds are used in a variety of savory or sweet recipes. Bronze fennel is deer resistant and it has no serious disease issues. It will self seed around if you let it but it's easy to pull and transplant it when it's at the seedling stage to another place in your garden. Bronze fennel, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, my cup flower that C-U-P flower 
is starting to bloom and that seems a little on the early side to me. Meanwhile, my Vitex tree is just starting to form buds on it and that seems a little late to me. So you can never predict from year to year. Over at the community garden plot, our zucchini, tomatoes and peppers are humming along as well as our cut flower garden. And in local gardening events, a few things you might want to attend include a reminder about our garden photo show opening reception on Sunday, July 30th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. at the Meadowlark Gardens in Vienna, Virginia in the Visitor Center lobby. You all are welcome and free to join us for that. And then the photo show runs in the lobby uh, through August 30th. Then... We have the Montgomery County Agricultural Fair for um, August 11th through 19th, and that's Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, you can enter your flowers and vegetables in competition on the Friday and Saturday of the first weekend of the fair, and that's August 11th and 12th. Over at Ledoux Topiary Gardens in Moncton, Maryland, they are having a Come Inside, a Manor House Open House on Friday, July 28th or August 25th between 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, guests at Ledoux can stroll through the 18th century home at no additional cost. The house is filled with English antiques and fox hunting memorabilia and the Oval Library is listed as one of the most beautiful rooms in America. So something inside to see at Ledoux. And outside, you can enjoy the Twilight Tuesdays in the garden, the magical early evening hours. Um, every Tuesday through August 29th, guests can enter the garden anytime and stay through the evening to enjoy sunset views, blooms, music, and special cafe offerings. And then Common Good City Farm in Washington, D.C. Uh, at 300 V Street Northwest, to be precise, is hosting their annual Back to School Tomato Jam. Uh, this is either free, up to $35 for tickets and uh, donation based, and they are celebrating all things tomato, um, and including tomato themed dishes, tasting a variety of tomatoes, games and crafts for kids, a farm tour music, and deliciously prepared foods. And then finally, something to put on your calendar to look ahead to September 12th through 15th is the Urban Tree Summit. Uh, being co-hosted by Casey Trees and Montgomery Parks. This is the 12th annual event, and you can register for that today through caseytrees.org. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area Area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at Amazon.com or Bookshop.org. Get low-maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book, Ground Cover Revolution, by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. 
included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. This is the last word on Pamela J. Harper. It's with sadness that I share the news that Pam passed away this week. She was a wonderful garden writer and terrific human being. I had the privilege of visiting her two acre garden in Tidewater, Virginia a few times myself and can say she was an outstanding host as well as wonderful photographer and writer if you've ever read or looked at any of her books. I also had the privilege of attending one of her talks and can say she was a plants woman extraordinaire. I knew from the time I saw the cover of Time Tested Plants 30 Years in a Four Season Garden that she and I were kindred souls. She's carrying one of her garden cats in her arms on the cover photo. Uh, If you haven't read a Pam Harper book, this is your chance and your reminder to do so. Pam is a wonderful, extraordinary person, and those of us in the garden world will miss her terribly. And this has been the last word on Pam Harper. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.